Greetings, everyone. We are so happy that you joined us today. And if you were with us in our last session, you will recall that we spoke or we focused on explicit instruction. Today, we'll be digging into what it means to integrate SEL through all academics. And so our question for you today is, and we ask that you respond in the chat, what comes to mind when you hear SEL and academic integration? What does this look like in your setting? Or what comes to mind when you think about SEL and academic integration? And we just ask, and then again, if you respond in text, that would be great. And I see lots of responses coming through, safe to learn, a whole child, collaborative, heavy workload, <laughs> okay, co-creating holistic approach, whole child. Yes, all of these things. Thank you. So when we think about SEL integration or academic integration, when fully implemented, SEL is infused in every student's school day in every interaction and setting. And this means the SEL must be seamlessly embedded throughout all practices and policies that affect students' experience in school, including academic content, instruction, discipline systems, and the whole continuum of academic and behavioral supports that the district may offer. Ideally, we think about academic integration being uh, fo focusing on fostering academic mindsets, on aligning SEL and academic objectives and using interactive instructional practices and structures to promote SEL. And when we look at the research on academic integration, a variety of studies have illustrated the ways in which SEL programming is integrated into academic content areas in the form of project-based learning. And we think about a brief in 2021 where Baines and colleagues argue that SEL and PBL are intrinsically supportive of one another, identifying collaboration, expression, reflection, and ownership as the key elements of SEL within PBL. But more specifically, a student-led project-based learning approach features collaborative problem solving and thus seeks to effectively integrate academic, social, and emotional learning. Now, as part of these learning strategies, students engage in their own continuous improvement cycle, learning through the co-construction of knowledge that is actively applied to address and identify concern, and then it's evaluated for its effectiveness. Adults, in this sense, act as coaches or facilitators, thereby increasing students' agency in their own, for their own inquiry and reflection. And we're going to show a short video now talking about uh, school-wide academic integration, so stay tuned. If you were to walk into a classroom where SEL is integrated into the day, you would see experiences and lessons where students are interacting a lot with each other, that the student's voice is as present, if not more present, than the teacher's voice, that the students have opportunities to deeply reflect on the material, on their own social-emotional competence, on ways in which the material relates to their personal lives. They'd have opportunities to reflect on the bigger experience and what, how that fits in. So they would be much more engaged in a deeply more personal way with each other and with the material that allows them to both process the material and to develop their own social-emotional competence at the same time. Integrated SEL is rooted in relationship. Whether that's teacher to scholar or peer to peer, the modeled behavior speaks the loudest. If you are struggling day in and day out, it does not matter how much planning and preparation you put in, okay? You have to make sure that you build the relationships with scholars, any veteran you talk to. I don't care what business industry you're in. If you want successful people working um, with you and around you, you have to make sure you build those relationships. You have to communicate. The same thing goes for a classroom, okay? When you're leading that classroom, you have to make sure that you have that connection, that you're empathetic with the children. We're gonna just jump right into our panels. So Dr. Stephen Becton is the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for Facing History and Ourselves. 
an organization committed to fighting bigotry and hatred and ending educational uh, inequity. Dr. Becton, can you come on screen? The, if, here we go. Hello, everybody. We go. Okay, I see you now. Yes, thank you. <laughs> good morning, good day, Dr. Becton. Good to be here. And then we also have on our panel, Dr. Allison Gould Boardman. She's an associate professor in equity, bilingualism and biliteracy in the School of Education at the University of Colorado Boulder and a former middle and elementary school special education teacher. Welcome, Dr. Boardman. Hello, welcome everybody. And Dr. Sarah Rem Kaufman, she is the Commonwealth Professor of Education at the University of Virginia. She and her team conduct research in, ele in on elementary and middle school classrooms with the goal of using evidence to improve the quality and equity of learning experiences for teachers and students. Welcome, Dr. Rem Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. We're so happy that all of you are here. All right, so we have lots of questions and lots of listening ears. So we're gonna jump right in. The first question is, what does SEL and academic integration look like in practice? What does SEL and academic integration look like in practice? And anyone can start. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, again, thank you all for being here and I'm. I'm looking forward to the conversation because I, I learned so much in, in these exchanges myself. I'll just quickly take you into a, a classroom if we if we could. I, I had the opportunity to, uh, at Facing History and Ourselves, we use historical case studies to help students think about history and their choices today. And we, we integrate SEAL in that. So I had the opportunity to go into a classroom. Imagine a classroom in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, uh, this particular school happens to have uh, almost all students of color, African-American students uh, mostly. And so this classroom was representative. It was students of almost all African-American. And I went into that classroom to teach the Holocaust, a unit on the Holocaust. And at first response, these kids were like, wow, what does this have to do with us, right? What happened to uh, European Jews in the 1930s and 40s? What's that have to do with me with a kid growing up in inner city Memphis? I raised that because social and emotional learning and academic, when integrated in academics, allows teachers an opportunity to take moments like that, close cultural gaps in the curriculum, uh, and really explore that question. That's a great question, right? What does this have to do with me? And that's a great social and emotional awareness question for students. So what ended up, and I, um, I wanna make space for my colleagues, but what ended up in that conversation was these amazing questions uh, around self-awareness, around uh, sort of, sort of uh, identity. Uh, for example, Adela, one of the students in the class, somewhere through them in the middle of studying the Holocaust, she raises her hand and she says, Mr. Becton, I always thought that only people that looked like me were victims of violence like this. And so we were able to have this amazing question about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a people that have been targeted for, for violence? And what does it mean to them to study another people in another place that was studied for for violence and students were just kind of struggling with those ideas together. So I think what I'm, what I'm, the case I'm raising here is that that social and emotional learning gives us the greatest opportunity to dig deeper into content in ways that we otherwise we are not if we don't do this serious integration. Love that example of identity and social awareness and just those questions. Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Boardman, thank you, Dr. Becton. Your thoughts? I'm happy to jump in. Um, one of the things that you're reminding me of, Dr. Becton, is just the importance of authentic learning experiences as a vehicle to get into the integration. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about project-based learning where students are 
engaged in authentic learning that feels meaningful and important to them. And I think that's what was happening in the Holocaust example is the teacher was able to engage the students in something that felt real. Mm -hmm. And so SEL was able to happen and grow in that way. And um, you know, one of the things we think about with project-based learning is that the students need those SEL skills in order to do project-based learning. And mm -hmm. so therefore it becomes authentic, mm -hmm. right? It's not something that's just a, a kind of random standard that needs to be met. It's something that students realize, boy, if I get better at collaboration, I'm going to be able to engage in this question. And I'll give just a little, you know, picture and, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. But for example, in, in ninth grade language arts, we have a project based learning project, which is a six to eight week unit organized around the question, what does it mean to be human? And students, you know, through this time, um, work on their own and, and in collaboration to, to explore various aspects of humanity. They gather evidence um, from text to identify and support a claim. And then they, they work together in design teams to create museum exhibits. And at the end, the museum exhibit is shared with, um, you know, a community of the choosing of the class. Um, so it could be, you know, a school community, or it could be um, something that happens at a library and some community members. Um, but while they're doing that, they're developing the language arts skills of, of close and critical reading, of argument writing, but they're also developing and having explicit instruction on collaboration, project management, um, social awareness. So. So SEL is part of the standards that students are working on, but it is just as authentic, the needs for it, as um, the questions that they're asking and exploring, what does it mean to be human? It feels like that kind of learning for them. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Boardman. Dr. Rem Coffin. Sure, I'd love to, in building on what Steve and Allison have said, um, I had the opportunity to lead a project in, in fourth graders fourth grade teachers and students who were integrating social emotional learning, service learning and science. Um, they were using a program called Connect Science. And um, in looking at what was happening in these classrooms, here's what I saw. So this is fourth grade and in the science curriculum, uh, they were expected to talk about renewable and non-renewable resources as part of the curriculum. And I saw teachers uh, using books to get students excited about civic engagement and taking responsibility in their community. And then I saw teachers teaching these fourth graders some skills, active listening, respectful communication, taking other people's perspectives. And then they were learning about energy and renewable and non-renewable resources. As they were learning about renewable and non-renewable resources, the students themselves discovered a problem that we're running out of these non-renewable resources. And that problem energized them to take action. And this is, you know, very carefully orchestrated by the teacher, uh, but really, the, you know, allowing a lot of student voice. Um, and then they went and they took action. Um, this particular classroom uh, had an energy fair that they called an energy festival where they had different stations and they invited students, families and teachers to come visit their uh, energy festival to learn about um, energy use and electricity. Well, thank you all for those real life examples of how we can uh, integrate SCL into the classroom. We always want those concrete examples and you all provided those so well. Thank you. Next question, any, anyone can take this question. Why is SCL and academic integration important? Why are we focusing and prioritizing SCL and academic integration? I'll go first, I'm unmuted. Um, uh, I think with this integration, we're actually taking something that's implicit and we're making it explicit. So students, whether they realize it or not, are using social emotional competencies as they learn all the time when they're doing academic work. So if you imagine a student solving a very complex math problem, they might get frustrated and feel a sense of helplessness, but then somehow manage to calm themselves down and continue to concentrate that's self-management. So having a teacher sort of point out, oh, look what you're able to do, 
it's making that process explicit so students understand that's a strength of theirs and they can use that in another place. Mm -hmm. Another example is when you think about a student trying to understand character intentions in a book. They're stretching to take the character's perspectives and in that way they're using their social awareness and teachers can point that out as a strength. I see in science there are a lot of wicked problems like battery use in cars. We can pull the thread and say, where does that lithium for the batteries come from? What's that process of extraction? Who is impacted by that process? Is this healthy for the earth? Um, and that teaches decision-making. So these very complex problems that need to be approached from different perspectives teach that kind of decision-making. Yeah. Dr. Ram Kaufman, I'm, I'm so happy you brought up this, that first example, because one of the best lessons that I've ever seen in SEL and academic integration was in a ninth grade algebra class in Chicago Public Schools, where the teacher said, this is going to be difficult, but I'm going to pitch you in teams and you're going to work together, you're going to collaborate, and you're going to, you're going to see what it feels like to struggle. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about how did that feel? Not only did you get the, the answer, the question right, but how did it feel to, to work as a team, to work through a challenging pro, uh, project together? And it was just a wonderful example of how you can you can we hopefully will have SEL integrated into every aspect of the of the student's life, including algebra class. <laughs> so, so, um, anyone else would like to respond to that to that question? I, I think I, I, we'll hear from both of you, Dr. Boardman. You want to start? And I'm then I'll sure. Go. You know, um, one thing that you're making me think of, Dr. M. Kaufman, is how um, important it is for the students to have that kind of meta awareness facilitated by the teacher. Um, so it's not just it, it, it's happening, it's integrated, but then the learning also comes from some of the explicit instruction, like how do we work in groups, how do we take different perspectives, how do we plan, and the reflection, how did it go, look what happened. But the other piece you're making me think of is how we can flip the role of the teacher and the perspective of the teacher when we integrate SEL and academic instruction. Because so many times, you know, teachers, you all are here, you feel, I mean, I'm so happy to see that we have 300 people on a call on a Friday morning. You know, you're so overwhelmed. There are so many standards, there's so much to do. And then people feel, well, how can we do SEL also? Or isn't it somebody else's job? But when we can change the mindset of the teacher and the students simultaneously, it becomes more meaningful and integrated for everyone. And so it's not like, oh, my kids can't work in groups, so they have to do it this other way. It's that, oh, I see that my kids can work in groups. They need to work in groups. And when they do that, it's more fulfilling for them. And it's more fulfilling for me as a teacher. And anytime I'm with students in these spaces and I watch teachers, there is sometimes this light bulb. It doesn't make it harder to teach. It actually makes it more rewarding, more meaningful, and maybe even a little bit easier sometimes. Thank you, Dr. Boardman. Dr. Beckton, you were. Yeah, that was interesting. I, I, I was just thinking about, and I know this would probably come up in our conversation at some point, but I bring it here. Just the importance of this in, in terms of education equity. Uh, this is an, to me, this is an equity imperative that we get this right of integrating SCAL in, into, into academics. There, because without it, we would continue to to uh, undereducate, miseducate, uh, even unintentionally sometimes, uh, 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 continue to perpetuate education inequities without this. And I'll be very specific. Um, students uh, that are already uh, suffering from systemic racism and structural racism have already been counted out when they come into some classrooms. And, 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 and then the learning is sort of uh, brought down to this give and get kind of exchange uh, that, that reinforces this idea that, that some students can't engage uh, deeply or they don't have the, the ability to engage emotionally and all this. So this is, a, this is an equity social justice imperative to me. And I, I, I see what's being raised in the chat around uh, uh, Mayor, I see what you're raising around how explicit we need to be. Otherwise, certain students would get left out. And I think uh, being intentional about SEL assures that certain students aren't being left out and left behind. 
rich conversation. We could go on and on, but I'm going to move to our next question. Thank you all for, for your responses there. Our, our next question is, where do you start? We get this question all the time. Where do you start? What are the key ingredients or foundational practices for SEL and academic integration? Great question. I kind of want to jump in here and, um, you know, I, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, but I think I, I think I am feeling the need to get back to the authenticity piece. So when I think of where to start, how to do it, um, I think that we need to situate our SEL experiences and all of our learning experiences in um, in learning that feels authentic and meaningful to everybody in the classroom. And, and you know, really to me connects with what you were just talking about, Dr. Becton, about um, what we expect of our students and what we believe that they can do. And when we give students interesting questions to ponder and we provide structure for them to do so, all of a sudden, teachers are seeing that the, there are kids who we thought couldn't do it, who, you know, didn't seem interested, who can absolutely do it and can engage and can bring in perspectives. And, and the richness that, that that fosters in a classroom is just the kind of setting the table for the SEL and academic integration that really you know, isn't there if nobody cares about what's happening in class. You know, if it's, if it's just the main goal is to learn how to write the essay, it's really not enough for students and we shouldn't be satisfied with that. So I that's what I think the start is. The start is with, with figuring out how to make learning feel meaningful for everybody. It's ex that's exactly right. I mean, it's what we were talking about earlier on. I think Dr. Becton brought up, brought up like, what, how does this learning apply to me? How can I make that real life application to what you're teaching me and make it real for me in, in, in terms of what's happening in my life? And so the more we can make that connection or that alignment, the better. Other thoughts about that question of how do you get started in this, in this academic integration work? You know, I noticed this could be a session within itself. Uh, you know, I, I also think about adult SEL uh, as, as part of the starting place. Uh, think about if educators themselves are not practicing self-awareness and, 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 and practicing, uh, you know, uh, their social awareness in the classroom. You know, teaching and learning is an interpersonal exchange, whether we think so or not. It's an interpersonal exchange between students and and scholars and, 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 and educators. And if adults are not critically conscious, are not questioning themselves, are not thinking about their own biases and the way that they show up in this country, we still have an uh, overwhelming majority white female teaching population, right? And a growing majority of students are, are students of color. So that in itself requires a bit of a self-awareness and doing some, some SE work on the educator's part as well. Then we will do student-centered learning because we'll ask our question, what is keeping me from seeing this kid from this zip code, from this place, from this space, whether it be dis disabled, whether it be socioeconomic, where do we, where, where do I, how do I see this student? And how do I ask myself those questions as I engage with these students to be critically self-conscious so I can center this student in the learning? I think that's an important start as well. Definitely, uh, Dr. Becton. We, we learned early on in our collaborating districts work the importance of it's in tandem. You know, we're obviously focused on student uh, building at students' SEL development and competency skill development. But that adult piece is critically important in helping us identify our own biases. Yeah. And um, in, in, in having that social awareness and that self awareness around our own biases and how are we bringing that into the classroom? Thank you all. Dr. Graham Kaufman, is it okay if I did you want to chime in or did I'm going to chime in really fast? Sure, with, go ahead. With, no, no, with no something rush. developmental here, I think, sure. which is, you know, in both elementary and middle school, there's this real need to create a sense of community in the classroom, and that's, a, mm -hmm. that's foundational. 
but it's also important to keep in mind that the practices that you would use in elementary school would be very different, for example, than in middle school. And so like where you might use, incorporate some lessons and practicing and modeling in elementary school, but don't do that in middle school. You know, that you really need to take a very different approach that makes things much more relevant in middle school. They need more voice and choice and it needs to really connect to their own lives and their own narratives of those lives. Thank you for that reminder about the voice and choice and really giving students its opportunity, you know, so that we're really thinking about and focusing on elevating student voice and giving those students this uh, leadership opportunities um, as well. Thank you all for again these wonderful responses. Next question is, can you give an example and you all did this early on, but can you give another an example of specific approaches that can support high quality SEL and academic integration. I could give you a one. It's, this is low hanging fruit, but this is a real powerful uh, strategy. Uh, rather than putting our teacher rules on the wall, you know, our classroom rules, those are important. Those, these are our classroom rules. But in addition, uh, we intentionally do something that we call contracting with students. And in, in a sense, it's setting norms for how we're going to behave in a learning environment, but empowering students to do it. We'll be, we'll be shocked at how many students, men can go K through 12 and not one person asks them, what do you think the learning environment ought to look like, feels like, sound like? And that, that's a great starting place. It says to students, I matter, oh, and then and when, when they do it, they own it and they start to, to sort of govern themselves. And that's when we know we've turned the classroom over. When the student can turn to another student and say it, we said we wouldn't talk over each other in class and we wouldn't interrupt each other. When the students are doing that, you've empowered them and they take that skill, that kind of self-awareness, self-management, social. These are all the five competencies right here, right? They take those skills out in the hallway, out into the, you know, they go beyond the classroom. So student-centered classroom management, where we give that over to them in a, is a powerful place, uh, a way to, to do this work. Most definitely. Thank you for that reminder. None of us want to be told what to do. I mean, adults are the same way. We don't want a principal or a superintendent coming in saying, this is what you're going to do without having that opportunity to have input. Other thoughts about, about that? Thank you, Dr. Beckton. I am, um, I, I, I love the idea and I think it's really crucial, this, the, the student voice and choice and another aspect and setting the community. I mean, I think that's one of the things if you don't have the community in the classroom, none of this work really can happen. Um, or it just feels like you're ticking off a checklist, but it, but it, it's it's not getting you anywhere. Um, I want to add another component as 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 the community is starting to become more trusting of one another and people feel more comfortable to take risks. One of the things that has been effective for us in the integration of SEL and PBL is to think of the progression of growth over time for whatever the individual skills are. So. Um, I think I'll give an example, which is um, in project based learning and, and the work that we've done is also in language arts. So the kinds of things that we are bringing out are very connected to language arts, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen in high school mathematics and science and social studies and align with the specific skills and standards that teachers are working towards in those classrooms. But as an example, you know, you can think of a writer. Um, how important the attention to audience is. And so in the beginning of the year, in the first PBL project that students do, the audience is actually other students in the classroom. And, what, and the purpose of that is to get kids to feel comfortable sharing with one another, sharing their work, giving and getting a little bit of feedback in a very friendly and low stakes way. And that came about because we had a project in um, Flint, Michigan. We had a lot of schools and the kids had not been asked to share their work. And so when the teachers first started, the kids were like, no, I'm not gonna do it. They just didn't have the comfort. They didn't feel the trust. So the first audience became the classroom. 
And then once students were able to kind of understand themselves, their peers feel a little bit more comfortable with the risk taking, you know, they could move towards things like um, in the example I just gave with the humanity exhibit, the perspective taking that students were able to work on as they thought about who is the audience for our museum exhibit. Are we going to have, um, you know, grandparents there, which means we might have to make the font bigger. Are we going to have people who speak different languages, which means we have to have things, you know, available. What, what if they're little kids, are they going to be able to engage with, with the discussion and the question, but that progression of audience from very small to bigger also allows those SEL skills to grow and deepen throughout the year. So thinking about how do you form in the beginning and then how do you build over time has been very useful for us. Excellent reminder of the arc of instruction and, and just expanding their, you know, a lot of times our kiddos are so focused on themselves of just ex expanding their world to say, you know, we've got to think about who else is going to hear this message and what's how it's going to impact their lives. So, Dr. Rem Coffin, did you sure, want to? Sure. Um, you know, what comes to mind, this is a strategy really for teachers themselves who want to work towards this integration. So a lot of lesson plans have a materials section, you know, and you need certain materials, you need to gather those materials. It's also worth pausing and saying, what social emotional skills need to be present in these students for this lesson and what classroom climate needs to be there so that students can take intellectual risks feel safe doing so communicate with each other effectively around the topic and by doing that it sort of pauses and says okay do i have all the materials i need do i have those skills and are those skills in place or do i need a way to sort of uh, ground kids uh, and reflect on what it is they need to bring before launching in. Um, and so I would say that's an exercise that teachers could do that would be very useful. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take us to our next question. And we get this quite often. So uh, I, I would love to hear from all three of you if possible. What considerations should we keep in mind when thinking about meeting the needs of all students including those with disabilities. And again, anyone can start, please. Yeah, you know, there, there are a couple of, again, this is not, they won't, this won't be new to us, but, but it just has to be a top of mind. And, it, and that is um, humanizing every student, right? Every student counts and, and every student's, you know, lived experiences, uh, you know, need to be humanized. And, and, and there's a, another word that we don't, talk about a lot in, 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 in school and that, and, and I think it's so connected to SEL and that's love, you know, uh, love and self-love um, and creating a, a classroom, classroom space where, where students are celebrated for who they are regardless. And, and so, but to particularly to speak to the, uh, to the disabilities piece, uh, what I found most powerful around this in the context of SEL, is is focusing on actually on the other students, building their empathy, uh, uh, building their abilities to walk in each other's shoes, uh, building and empathy is a skill. It's not just some feel good thing. Like how do we actually promote empathy in teaching and learning? Uh, the 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 level of violence and stuff that we're seeing among youth to me is one of direct correlation is a lack of empathy. And, and, and empathy is not, again, it's a skill. So as we lesson plan, why not ask ourselves as I'm teaching this unit, where are these opportunities for us to be an empathetic skill in our students? So for them to imagine what it means to be a more empathetic person. And so th those are some of the, uh, yeah, thank you for raising gold in Muhammad's book, Cultivating Genius, uh, Timothy, that's a great resource. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Becton. Does anyone else uh, want to add to Dr. Becton's response? Okay, we're gonna, we have, oh. This Sarah, one. go ahead and then I'll jump oh, in. Yeah, please, please. Okay, um, you know, I think I'm sort of building what, what Dr. Becton said. I was really thinking about leveraging those teacher-student relationships um, as being so essential. And um, that also, um, 
opportunities to reflect on what the school looks like from the perspective of students with disabilities. And that brings me to this point that Dr. Beckton is bringing up about, you know, thinking about the other students um, and developing their empathy. One thing to keep in mind developmentally that I think is so interesting is that kids are much better at being, kids and all humans are better at being empathetic of people who are like them, people who are similar, people who live near them. And so what we're always trying to do is stretch students, stretch the, the students to whom they can be empathetic. And that stretching process is our mm -hmm. role as educators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we call that, there's a term we use for that is increasing students' universal obligation. It's a great social and emotional question. Ask it like, who's in your universal obligation? Well, you know, who do you think about when you get up? Who, who, who do you think about when you think about justice? When you think about fairness, when you think about inclusion, who comes to mind? And then have students stretch their universal obligation beyond what they would normally think about is a great way for them to exercise their, their, their empathy. I wrote that I down, that. universal obligation. I do too, Dr. Booker. I know, I love that. that term. And it really reminds me a lot of um, kind of the thinking around inclusive learning environments and what inclusion means for students with disabilities. And I think so many times inclusion becomes just a, a thing that has to happen. You know, it's, it's in a student's individual education plan that they're included for X amount of time, but it's not very thoughtful. And and, and if that environment can become this, this um, universal space, you know, the, the approach to it will be, would be quite different. And I just wanted to share, we recently did a study where we interviewed kids that were in these kind of integrated SEL classes and we asked them about their perceptions. You know, what did you learn and what went well for you and what didn't go well and what recommendations you had. And one of the things or a couple of things that were super interesting were um, that the answers weren't so different, you know, that that the things that kids um, felt that they learned and felt that they enjoyed for kids with and without disabilities were quite similar. Um, and that really shows us that this kind of environment can work for everybody. So I think that's important. And there were a few differences. Um, and, and one of the differences was that the kids with disabilities overall tended to be more sensitive to the kind of the vibe in the collaborative groups. They really appreciated the groups, but they had a little bit more trepidation about sharing. Sometimes they worried that their ideas weren't good enough. Um, they worried that they didn't have some, you know, that they weren't able to help other kids as much as other kids could help them. And, and when teachers were aware of that, of the sensitivity of, of some students with disabilities, then it allowed them to create supports that kids needed to be able to feel and be valued members you know, in that community. And another thing I think, um, just one other thing I'll point out is there was much more variation across kids with, in, with disabilities and how they responded. Mm -hmm. And what that sort of shows us or reminds us is how important it is for teachers to build the individual relationships in order to know what kids need and what kinds of additional supports might be warranted. Because you know there's never one group and everybody's gonna be the same. But the kids without disabilities, their responses actually were more similar to one another than the kids with disabilities were. And so that need to really develop those individual relationships is so important. Um, and we can do it and we can do it. Definitely a great reminder of, of just the importance of building the community. And, and I, would, um, I would imagine Dr. Uh, Kaufman, I'm, I'm sorry, Boardman, that, that over time, those, those, all of the students were becoming more sensitive to the needs of, of kids with disabilities and without, and so that they became more supportive. But uh, thank you all for those responses. Um, our, our next question is, what are the educator mindsets, dispositions, and the way they approach students that are necessary for high quality SEL academic integration? How can educators navigate potential biases? And I'll repeat that because it was a long one. What are the educator mindsets, dispositions, and just the way they approach students that are necessary for high quality SEL academic integration? How can educators navigate potential biases? 
So let's make sure to, I mean, that's a, a multifaceted question, but what came to top of mind for me is to steer away from these deficit-minded frameworks like achievement gap, uh, what these students can or cannot do, because, you know, uh, frameworks that, that, that really looks at kids from a deficit standpoint, the culture deficits models, kids aren't broken, their homes aren't broken, they're not broken. Um, uh, so, so staying away from those models. Yes, social economics is real, low social economic poverty is real, lack of resources is real, but let's not attach those, those things to what students can and can't do. And that, and and I'm telling you, good and bad, bad pe people do this. Good teachers do this because it's baked in to our society to think about kids from this deficit model, depending on where they're coming from. And so we have to consciously resist that. Yeah, you know, constantly resist the idea that we won't we won't practice the the uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Mm -hmm because a student uh, lacks certain material things. Mm -hmm. So resisting that is the work of all educators, not white, not black, not all educators need to resist these historical deficit models. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanna offer up that SEL will push us to move from these uh, deficit models to thinking about things like opportunity, civic engagement, and, and not, you know, just this sort of like black white achievement gap, which is which itself is loaded with with issues of inequity and and, and it's problematic. It really is about being self aware and our own biases because you're right. We all have our biases and just being yeah. aware of them and how we are addressing them. Thank you, Dr. Becton. Other thoughts about that question, Dr. Rome Kaufman or Dr. Boardman. Kind of wanted to add on. Um, the work that you're talking about, Dr. Becton, is so deep and it takes time for yeah. teachers. And so I think we have to be careful when we plan our professional learning times that it's not just about giving teachers the lessons and showing them how to do it. It's not just about, you know, if you have this, this great idea and you put kids in groups and it's meaningful, it will work for them. Because I think teachers have to really own that sometimes deep down, they may not trust their students to have big ideas, to be able to be competent enough to own the learning. And so we have to do that really hard and very uncomfortable work sometimes to face like what is it that I believe about my students mm -hmm. and how can I work really hard in, in community with other educators to, to peel away some of these, these kind of horrible truths inside to be able to change the way that I approach my class. And, you know, I wish it would just happen with a great set of lesson plans or a wonderful curriculum and the work the truth is we know that it doesn't. So we have to create spaces in schools for teachers to do that hard work. Yeah. And then your project-based learning becomes real. These are just activities. There's a connection to the project-based learning in the way that I'm showing up with students. And it makes all of that more authentic and not just activities, but authentic engagements. I'll add a couple things here. Uh, to that, is there a moment to do that? Oh yes, go ahead, please, okay. <laughs> please do. So it occurs to me, you know, if you sing, your voice is your instrument, and if you teach, you and everything you carry with you is what you're bringing. That's your instrument, and so it occurs to me to help, you know, helping teachers sort of be increasingly aware of who they are how they fit into our broader system, what privileges and challenges they've experienced and approach the children in their classroom in the same way, understanding the systems and the way that the systems have failed some of their students. And yet these students come in with incredible strengths that can be identified and leveraged and enjoyed and, and can grow from there. Um, it occurs to me that um, 
we have some resources in schools that we may not be tapping into to create this integration. Um, so for example, many schools have a reading specialist or math specialist or science specialist. And it seems like having them or social studies, having them seeped and understanding a lot of premises around social emotional learning can help them um, sort of lead some of these conversations or think about the instruction in a different way. Um, also, it occurs to me that many, some schools have professional learning communities, and that can be a space where some of these adult conversations can happen. Thank you for that reminder of just, you know, we talk about this a lot at Castle, that every single stakeholder, every single adult is in, in the building as part of the SEL um, mm -hmm. instructional process from the cafeteria worker to the principal to the to the you know, reading specialist to the counselor the nurse everybody is is responsible for hopefully modeling the skills that we hope to see in our students so thank you for for those reminders we're going to transition into we're getting some questions coming in so if it's okay with the panel i'd like to to transition into some of the the questions that are coming in from our from our viewers right now and see this one, and you addressed this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to give you another chance to respond to this person's question. And, and this is directed to Steve. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Becton. Steve is right. <laughs> okay. Um, it says, how can we, should we address educators who may have difficulty with acknowledging their own cultural biases that in turn impact the type of learning that goes on in their classroom? Love the question, thank you. First of all, you know, part of the work I do is sort of lead conversations around issues of bias and race. And something that has happened in a larger society that's manifesting itself in schools is that we have erroneously uh, e equated bias with racism. Mm. So people have trouble admitting that they have bias because we've used those words interchangeable, bias and racist, or bias and sexist, or bias is, you know, Bias is, it is not equated with that. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Eberhard wrote a book on this about bias. You should, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat, uh, but it's an amazing book. But to answer the question, that, that's the starting point. We need to, under, to be able to own that, that, that we all have bias, <laughs> you know, and be comfortable with admitting that. It doesn't make you a bad person. We all have it. And then once we can really sit with that, that truth. I often ask teachers, how many of you all decided to become educators so that you could you can marginalize poor kids of color and create uh, you know inequity in schools? Did you sign up to be? So I also start with I don't believe any educator. Mostly, I, I never met an educator who that was their intent. So we all have bias, and we also can have bad impact. All of us can have bad impact. So it's normalizing the fact that we all have bias and that we all can do things that are not in the best interest of kids. And until we accept that we all have the, the ability to do that, we're gonna continue to have this conversation around good and bad teachers or racist teacher or not racist teacher. It's a bad framework. So don't ask yourself, do I have bias? bias? Ask yourself, where is my bias? <laughs> And you what know, am I going to do to address it? And now I can address it, right? It, but it to me, it sounds simple, but just getting people to sit with and own that we all have it. And then, and if we don't address it, kids become the 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 the, the victims of it, not, not the adults. We're sitting around adults trying to feel better about whether we bias or not, while kids are suffering the the, the outcomes. So so thanks for, for the question. Thank you for the response. And, and this question goes to all of you or whoever would like to answer. There's, um, there are several questions coming in about teacher resistance and teacher buy-in and feeling like their plate is already full. What guidance can you offer? Mm. Not, the, the whole, not one more thing on my plate syndrome, yeah. I call it. I, I think it's already on the plate. I think all of this is already on the plate. And so helping teachers to do some self-reflection and analysis about, um, you know, here, here are the different components of SEL, what's happening in my context and in my classroom, and then kind of negotiating, sort of co-designing, if you will, where am I going to start with this? Where does it make sense 
um, I'm, I'll just get back to, to the, the authenticity words, you know, what, what do I need? What do my kids need? And that I think is a really, um, is a way to help teachers have buy-in because you're actually negotiating together to support them with something that they feel they need and want and could benefit from um, and bringing that to the classroom. So that would be one tip that I would have is for us to spend a little bit more time starting small and figuring out what makes sense to do right now. What can I handle? Mm -hmm. Not feeling overwhelmed. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Anyone else want to uh, add? I'll add something. So, you know, if that's a concern that's coming maybe from a science teacher or a math teacher, it's it's possible to take a fresh look at some of the standards that they're that may be used in their state. So if you take, for example, science as an example, there are these science and engineering practices, and some of them are, you know, people are using curriculum that are aligned with these practices and they involve social emotional learning. So for example, obtaining, evaluating, communicating information that involves relationship skills, listening when people have different views, communicating orally about ideas, engaging in argument from evidence. These are NGSS practices. Students need to be in a safe and supportive environment to take risks. So kind of demonstrating like, well, actually, you know, the standards and the curricula that you're using that are following from these standards are already embedding some of these skills. And so now it's a matter of making those explicit in your classroom and noticing those. Mm -hmm. Developing that common language. We, we always go into school districts and saying, you're already doing a lot of these practices. It's like, how can you, uh, Dr. Ring Poffin, as you just said, how can we explicitly talk about some of the practices and how can we build on those? So creating that common language and identifying what's already and leveraging what's already happening in terms of excellent or high quality SEL practices and strategies. Thank you all so very much for, for what I feel has been a very rich conversation. I want to just bring up some of the key takeaways that we've learned today from, from the discussions. Uh, just a reminder, SEL and academic integration deepens learning and engagement in all content areas, not just in SEL classes or SEL um, advisories, it's in all content areas, hopefully. And educators can support this integration by creating those supportive environments where we're creating those meaningful connections that we've talked about in content and weaving as much as possible SEL um, strategies and practices throughout all the pedagogical practices. Having opportunities for cooperative structures and reflection these are essential um, aspects of this academic integration in terms of um, making sure that it's happening in all grades and all subjects. And these opportunities sh should be connected to explicit instruction and re a reminder that student voice, student leadership is, is critically important. And then in terms of our state policymakers, if they can create ripe conditions for SEL acad and academic integration, by elevating and promoting and supporting evidence-based programs and professional learning programs that support our educators so that they're able to incorporate SEL into all academics would be so helpful. So again, thank you all, Dr. Becton, Dr. Rim um, Kaufman, Dr. Boardman for your discussion, for your conversation today.